Well, good morning, Greenwich, and welcome to the Thursday, November 4th edition of The Basement Academy. Our morning psalm is one we've read a number of times. It's Psalm 124. It's very short. I would encourage you to get to know this psalm well. Again, if you're praying the psalms daily, you'll see this on the 24th, I'm sorry, on the 4th of every month, Psalm 124. <clears throat> and it's 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 prayed in the context it's the journeying up to jerusalem okay so it's one of the pilgrim psalms they would sing or chant this as they traveled to jerusalem for worship and it recalls the time when israel was being attacked the allusion probably is to the historical allusion to pharaoh's army chasing the israelites there at the red sea they escaped through the red sea and then the waters came back over um, Pharaoh and his army and so there's some language that that alludes to that but it's a great psalm to pray for ourselves for our loved ones or anyone you know who is facing a time of opposition or significant trial that is overwhelming them praying praying for the Lord's escape and the Lord's deliverance our help is in the name of the Lord is how it ends and so and so let's uh, pray Psalm 124 together If the Lord had not been on our side, let Israel say, if the Lord had not been on our side when men attacked us, when their anger flared against us, they would have swallowed us alive. The flood would have engulfed us. The torrent would have swept over us. The raging waters would have swept us away. Praise be to the Lord who has not let us be torn by their teeth. We have escaped like a bird out of the fowler's snare. The snare has been broken, and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Amen. Lord, hear our prayer for ourselves, for loved ones, uh, for any who face uh, an attack or an overwhelming flood this day. Be their help and strength. Amen. Okay, as we... Uh, kind of bring the plane in for a landing. This is, we're concluding our fourth week of unlearning evangelism. And so today and tomorrow, we'll wrap it up and then we'll kind of pick up, I'll, I'll tell you tomorrow what we're going to do for the next couple of weeks. But um, I, I spoke to this some weeks ago, I think the first week, probably third, first, you know, second or third day. <clears throat> the difference between evangelism and evangelicalism or evangelical. The words are very close to each other, but they mean two different things. Now they're clearly related. The word evangel or good news, okay, that's our word evangel, is from the Greek euangelion, which just means good news, the good news of Christ. Okay, so evangelism, as we've been saying for some several weeks, is the act or process of proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. He comes to save, he comes to redeem, he comes to forgive, all of that, okay? Evangelism is bringing that good news to others, to the world. Evangelical is different. One who believes the evangel and who believes in the necessity of that good news is an evangelical, okay? So it's more a person, okay? It's an individual. So evangelism is a process. Evangelical is a belief or a, a, an individual who believes certain things. Uh, David Bevington, uh, a British historian, has identified four um, core components to evangelical belief. It is what sets evangelicals apart from other Christian believers. There are I don't know how this could be, but there are Christians who, who distance themselves from the term evangelical. Now, Bebbington gives a fourfold definition. I was asked to um, uh, do a, a book review of this book after Evangelicalism, The Path to a New Christianity by David Gashi, who claims to be a former evangelical, or he's coined a term ex-evangelical, people who once were evangelicals, but no longer believe that. They distance themselves from it, okay? Now, 
I'm going to give you Bebbington's definition and then I'm going to give you Gashi's definition and how I critiqued his definition. So I did write that book review. It was published maybe six months ago. Probably should have told you all about that. But anyway, it was kind of fun to do. Bebbington says evangelicals have four core beliefs. The first is a belief in the Bible, the authority of the Bible, the integrity of the Bible, uh, the centrality of, of the Bible. We believe these scriptures, I, I gladly claim myself to be an evangelical. Evangelicals claim these as the infallent, infallible, inerrant word of God. That what I read here, God inspired through his Holy Spirit. He saw it through human authors. It was recorded, preserved. It comes to us with truth that we can build our lives on. Does it speak to every situation on planet earth? No, but everything it speaks to is true. These are true words. Evangelicals believe the Bible. Because of that, they have an emphasis upon the cross of Jesus Christ. And so evangelicals believe lots of things, but, but Bebbington identifies a core belief is that evangelicals lift up the centrality of the cross of Jesus Christ. Because we teach the scriptures, we believe something about the human family, the human condition, sin. And so the good news of the gospel is set against the bad news of human sin and rebellion against God. And so the centrality of the cross, Paul writes, I resolve to know nothing amongst you but Christ and him crucified. And so we believe what Jesus Christ did on the cross atoned for the sins of the world and for our sins. A third core belief is that evangelicals assert, as with the scriptures do, that one must believe that message of Jesus on the cross in order to be in a saving relationship with God. I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And so this commitment to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, to all who believed in him, to all who received his, uh, to all believed in his name who received him, he gave power to become the children of God. John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 12. So belief in Jesus Christ, belief in his death, belief in his resurrection, this is how one gets in on salvation, okay? So we appropriate or we embrace or we receive Christ. Anytime you hear language of a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, you can count on it that you're talking to an evangelical. That's an evangelical emphasis. So we proclaim Christ. We invite people to know him. Hence evangelism, okay? Uh, the fourth core belief that Bebbington identifies is kind of an active life, a life of discipleship, which does manifest itself in some expression of evangelism, either through good works, certainly through, through uh, sharing the good news. But evangelicals understand that God has created us for good works, as we just heard Eric uh, teach and preach a couple of weeks ago on Sunday. God has prepared good works for us to do that we should live into them or walk in them. So four core beliefs. There are other things that, that they believe, but, but, but evangelicals are characterized by centrality of the Bible, centrality of the cross, the centrality of personal conversion, faith in Jesus Christ, and then an active life of service and witness in Jesus' name, okay? That is a good definition of what an evangelical is. I'm an evangelical. My guess is that many of you are as well, okay? Now, I was asked to read this book as an evangelical and offer a critique. I was asked by a friend who um, expresses himself to be an evangelical, probably leans a little further left in some theological understandings uh, and practices than I'm comfortable with, but he certainly lifts up the centrality of Jesus. But here's how David Gushy tries to define an evangelical. Let's take a test to see if you qualify as an American evangelical. Put a check in the box beside the item if you know what I am referring to in any of the following 25 references. And I'm showing, for if you're listening on the podcast, you can't see this, but if you're watching on video, you see. And so it's five, at 25 different items. Lord, I lift your name on high, name of a song. John Piper, he's a, a theologian complementarianism, okay? It's a belief about men and women. The 700 Club, 
Pat Robertson. The Message, the translation by Eugene Peterson. Wheaton College, where Billy Graham went up in Chicago, Illinois. Azusa Pacific, out there, uh, an evangelical school out in uh, Southern California. Moody, or the Moody Bible Institute. Veggie Tales, Zondervan. God Didn't Make Adam and Steve, which is kind of a, a snarky little thing that some folks say. Christian Zionism, that is seeing the uh, rest restoration of Israel. Father Hold Me. Okay, I don't know that one. Must be a song. Bob Jones, Bob Jones University. Biblical Inerrancy. Hmm, I just talked about that, right? I Kissed Dating Goodbye, a book by Joshua Harris, 1997. John MacArthur, a preacher of the gospel, evangelical preacher in, in California. Eugene Peterson, right? <laughs> <laughs> the author of The Message, uh, one of my favorite uh, pastors and authors. Purity rings. Dads would give purity rings to their daughters to wear. Reparative, thera re reparative therapy, believing that um, one can uh, be restored from homosexuality. Left Behind, the Left Behind series. Hell houses, um, like on Halloween, kind of go through a hell house and try to scare people out of going to hell and then present the gospel to them. Tim LaHaye, the writer of the Left Behind series. Tony Evans, a gospel preacher. The Rapture, a focus on the end times, okay? 24 of the 25 I could identify. Now, he goes on from there and the paragraphs that follow are somewhat mocking and snarky around people who believe in those things. And so in my book review, I critiqued how unfair that is for nowhere in this book does Gashi, a professor and pastor, interact with a widely accepted, broadly understood definition of what an evangelical is. Instead, he gives this kind of popularized, almost snarky view of what an evangelical is. And there's the issue, okay? There's the issue. Evangelical and its uh, associated word evangelicalism, again, those who are evangelicals and the beliefs that they hold are understood to be evangelicalism, okay? So the belief system that evangelicals hold around the Bible, the cross, personal conversion, and activism, evangelicalism has been co-opted and has become corrupted. It has been maligned. It is now attacked. Just, excuse me, this week, I was already planning on doing this study today, okay? And one of our elders sent this article to me, define evangelical, please. Alas, many Americans don't think this is a religious term. And then it goes on, Ryan Burge, who's a, a researcher of the church, particularly evangelicalism. The data indicates that self-identified evangelicalism is not declining, that is, non-attenders and non-Protestants are taking on the label, thus transforming the term into a cultural political signifier, not a theological one. Okay, the timing of this is beautiful. To get the, I was gonna be talking on this anyway, because I wanted to get clear in our minds that we not confuse the word evangelism with the word evangelical or evangelicalism. Evangelical is somebody, it's a religious term. It's a theological term. It's one who believes certain things about the scripture, about the cross, about Jesus Christ and salvation and about the, the Christian life. But it has become co-opted into a political term. The much ballyhooed 2016 election of Donald, election, of Donald Trump at the hands of 81% of white evangelicals, okay, you've probably heard that stat repeated. If you haven't, you're hearing it here first then. So how did this man get elected? And we all know that the Trump administration was very polarizing. I'm not, I don't care who you vote for, who you, what you think about Donald Trump, that's immaterial to me. That a number of people voted for him who self-identified as evangelicals is what has made the rounds. And so Burge is, is playing off of that. The exit polls, who did you vote for, Donald Trump? Do you consider yourself an evangelical? Yes. They didn't ask any questions. They didn't say, 
do you believe in the Bible as the inerrant word of God? Do you believe in the cross of Jesus Christ as the, the, the atoning work for salvation? Have you experienced conversion in his name? Have you been, are you actively serving him? That's not the question that's asked at the exit poll. Do you self-identify as an evangelical? Sure. Well, it turns out on further study and review, a number of people who are identifying as evangelicals and don't go to church are not believers, but somehow supporting Donald Trump and the Republican Party platform has become associated with evangelicalism and, and the two are becoming enmeshed. Do evangelicals support Donald Trump? Certainly. Do many evangelicals not support Donald Trump? Certainly. But culturally, what is now happening or has happened, and Burge is saying that is continuing, that the word evangelical is no longer a faith-based theological religious term. It has become a political term. It's synonymous now with a Trump supporter or a Republican, but typically a Republican Trump supporter. And so evangelical churches are bad things in terms of kind of the culture, okay? And so Gashi's book is all about, it, it's really, it's a straw man argument. He sets up the straw man of what an evangelical is kind of in a mocking tone and then knocks him down. And so I, I, I said it as much. I tried to be kind. You know, there were some, it was a nice wake up call. Thank you that there are people who are leaving the evangelical churches because of certain things. Thank you, uh, Dr. Gashi. As a pastor, I appreciate that and will labor uh, to, to care for others, but dirty pool on his part, okay? And so evangelical has become a political term, and this, this little article uh, this week reflects that. Another reading that came out last week, an article um, uh, by a guy named Peter Weiner uh, in The Atlantic about evangelicalism is breaking apart. And so we're technically a mainline church at Greenwich. And so we wouldn't typically, you don't identify, nobody identifies the mainline Presbyterian church with evangelicals. That's why we don't fit in our denomination. We're an outlier because Greenwich is a solidly evangelical church. We preach Christ in him crucified. We thoroughly uphold the authority and the errancy and the infallibility of scripture. Um, we, we call for conversion. We call for belief in Jesus' name. We're trying to engage people in works of service uh, and evangelism uh, and mercy. All the definitions we're living at Greenwich. We are an evangelical church, but, but we're kind of um, in hiding. You know, we're, we're kind of incognito. Most evangelical churches are um, identified non-denominationally or maybe in the Southern Baptist Convention. There's there's strong connection with the evangelical um, wing of the church. <clears throat> and so what it is, the, the, because there's been a, a co-opting and corrupting and associating with evangelicalism with a political term and political party and political platform and positions, because of the Trump phenomenon, it's, it's, it's kind of dividing the Republican Party, right? And so that is now working its way into churches and churches who are grounded on a political understanding of evangelicalism. They are finding themselves at odds with each other. And so there is this fracturing that, that Peter Weiner writes about in his article, the, the, the coming apart of evangelicalism. <clears throat> at Greenwich, we, don't, we lift up the evangel. We lift up Christ. We lift up the cross. We teach the scriptures. I don't care who you vote for. And I hope you don't care who I vote for. Those are not the most important things, right? We talk about that all the time. Our hope is lodged somewhere else. That's why the results of this week's election, great. Who cares? So what? Whatever, you know? Um, in the temporal uh, world, I understand that it has impact, but we seek a city uh, that, that, that has uh, a foundation, <laughs> whose architect and builder is God, a, a lasting city. Here we have no lasting city. Um, and so we spoke to that recently. So here's what I suggest. So I wanted to clarify a couple things. 
I continue to use the word evangelical. I have friends who believe as I do, who are now distancing themselves from the term because they believe it has become so corrupted, it can no longer be heard, okay? I say, let's do something else. How about we leverage this confusion over the word as an opportunity for witness? I had an occasion probably three, maybe uh, probably four years ago, it was before mom came to be with us. So probably four-ish years ago, was out visiting my brother in Seattle, uh, who is not an evangelical believer. And somehow he got, we got talking politics because my mom loved politics. And so there's always some wrap around that. And he said something about you evangelicals and your votes for ex-president or Y president. And I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. evangelical is not a political term. It's a religious term. He goes, no, it's not. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a political term. And I said, well, excuse me, I am one. <laughs> and it's, it's a religious term. It's a theological term. And I proceeded at that moment to say, I did this. Evangelical comes from the word evangel, which simply means good news. And an evangelical is one who believes the good news of Jesus Christ and his death on the cross. And so I use that discussion and disagreement as an opportunity to witness to my brother. Now, I'd shared with him before, but that was one more opportunity to speak truth and and hopefully to do it in love. But to clarify, it is not a political term and anyone who thinks it is, is wrong. Now, they may still continue to use that, okay? And so in the same way, people who say that two men uh, getting married is a marriage, that's not a marriage. Marriage is a man and a woman, okay? You can call the animal that has a really long neck, kind of yellow animal, brown spots, and eats its you know leaves off the tree really high. You can call that a horse, but it's a giraffe, okay? So you can call things what you want, but it doesn't change. So evangelical is a theological term. I am an evangelical. And when that gets, when I hear that as a political term, I will try to gently get in the conversation and clarify, you know, there's some confusion there. It's actually a theological term. And I try to share the gospel briefly. I will share about Jesus. So anyway, perhaps you can do that as well. That is what I wanted to talk about today. Tomorrow we will wrap up our study of evangelism, uh, unlearning evangelism for these four weeks. And then we're going to dive into some stuff next week by way of replay, okay? And I'll tell you more tomorrow, okay? Let's pray. Father, thank you uh, for the evangel, the good news of Jesus Christ, how we celebrate his death and resurrection and the life that comes to us in his name. Help us to open our hearts wider for Jesus and make his name known through us, especially in times of confusion Help us to bear witness to this living hope that we have through Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, even as he taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. May the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who saves, may he watch over you, bless you, keep you this day and forevermore. Amen.